Okay. Because as per usual, I don't want <coughs> us to necessarily miss anything. So I'm going to throw to the title since you're having a bit of water. Can I just say, if I was still drinking, I would say I am so fucking hungover today, but i not still drinking, but that's how I feel anyway. It's time for the Access of the Easy Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of the Axis of Easy Salon. This is number, is this 43 now? Or did we do, no. this is number 43. Mark Jeftovic from Toronto, Jesse Hirsch from the Ottawa Valley, Charles Hugh Smith from Hawaii. And we're recording this on Thursday, May 6th, 2021. What do you guys want to talk about today? Charles? Well, I wanted to ask you, Jesse, about TikTok as the new platform for stock and crypto recommendations. I've seen some references to that. Um, really? <laughs> yeah, and, and I realize that's somewhat of a light topic, but uh, I wanted but, to but mention not, it. But not if you consider it a symptom of the insanity we're constantly describing. <laughs> yes, that's right. It's a good intro to that. Mark, I wanted your feedback on um you know, this strange um, transfer of 100 million, you know, addresses yeah. from the Pentagon. I, yeah. I have no idea if that's just some quirk that it will disappear under the waters or if it'll be consequential. Uh, those, those are two things off the top of my head. Mark? Well, that kind of dovetails into I was going to comment on um, Jesse's conspiracy as post literacy article and uh, and Charles, what you wrote about um you have to you have to be a speculator in today's markets but the 100 million or the whatever million ip address thing i did a show on that with brian jackson tech talk canada or it business canada and and i had perfectly mundane explanations for him but because we're here i could go with the conspiracy version of the explanations well, and, and let me just point out, Brian's no longer with IT World Canada, so let's not give him credit for uh, his work. Oh, I'm sorry. But it, uh, okay. but it was interesting to see you uh, to talk about that stuff, because like Charles, I agree. I saw that story and I thought, I want to hear what Mark has to say about this, because it is one of those stories that could easily just be lost on everybody. And it, I, I, I came up with blanks as to I know there's something here, but what is it? So I second Charles's request. You know, we, I think it might have been at the end of an episode, or it might have even been after we stopped recording on an episode. We sort of floated the idea that we're currently in a global conflict, and mm. cyberspace is the domain in which it's happening. And it was kind of under the frame that cybersecurity as a, a news category is, while sensational, while getting headlines, is actually kind of undertapped. Like it's neglected because while it's reported on in terms of here's why you need to do your updates and here's the data that they got out, the state-based elements are often left out of the reporting. And and and. That's not always the case. I mean, I'm, I'm, there is a lot of coverage about Russia. There's a lot of coverage about North Korea and China. Not a lot of coverage about the U.S. government. Not a lot of coverage about some of the other state-based hackers. Uh, uh, Israel being a big one that, you mm. know, perhaps deserves more scrutiny. So I think that is a topic maybe we should revisit today in terms of looking at whether cybersecurity deserves more geopolitical analysis to really substantiate the nature of the conflict currently taking place in cyberspace. I haven't so read Mark, it yet, but I just got Kill Chain, right? Christian Broses, uh, because I heard Dimitri Kafinos talking with, was it Niles Ferguson or was it somebody? And they were talking about this book. And so I got it and I haven't, um, I haven't, cracked the cover yet because it just came yesterday but uh where so given that we've well i was gonna say we've got two votes for the uh ip address transfer so two to one you're up mark okay so i mean there's there's the 
there's the mundane explanations which are all perfectly plausible like when uh when when brian was asking me could it be this could it be this i'm like absolutely like the pentagon rationalization for it was these are all unrooted ip blocks and they wanted to start announcing them just so they could more easily detect which ones were being um uh announced without authorization there's a word in there i'm just kind of uh uh it, that's that's slipping my mind right now and that's a perfectly plausible explanation because that kind of thing happens all the time that people find net blocks that aren't being announced and then they just start announcing them and doing all kinds of crazy things and it happened to us with some of our unrooted ip space thank god it was unrooted because it took us a couple of weeks to straighten it out and one of the reasons they use unrooted is because if you do this with some, if you overwrite somebody else's roots, it's going to get dampened pretty quick. Like it's going to get fixed pretty quick because there's like coalitions of network operators and mailing lists and they sort of like filter out all these bogons they're called. But um, when this happened to us, I realized that the underlying layer, the rooting layer of the internet, the border gateway protocol, the BGP tables, there's no security. It's held together with spit and twist ties. It's a fucking nightmare. It frightened me and I lost sleep when I realized how insecure it is. And uh, I've written up about it and I've talked to people who know more about that level than I do because I, by my own admission, I'm kind of a moron at the, at the lowest level layers of the of the osi stack but uh it really scared the crap out of me and so someone's saying we've got you know this gigantic um block of net space we should light it up just so we can flush out all of the bogus roots that might be out there absolutely plausible perfectly uh rational explanation for it now if you want to say what's the conspiracy theory behind it i think it goes into you know, Brian asked me, can, can it be used for surveillance? Well, not really. That's not really where sur the way surveillance occurs. It occurs at different levels. You can use it maybe for passive monitoring, passive DNS, set up a sensor array, that kind of thing. But what you could use that kind of address space for is an offensive attack, like a DDoS, right? That's where you start to expand your, your attack area. Uh, that's very plausible for something like that. And then if I had a tinfoil hat handy, I would put it on for the next part because, and someone mailed me and he said, you know, I find it kind of weird that, um, well, for one thing, uh, Dan Kamensky died unexpectedly and we didn't know the cause of death first. Okay. So this is just on the day that he died and all anybody knew rest in peace, Mr. Kamensky. Uh, but anyhow, all we knew was that he had died. And then this same story broke. And it kind of goes to your story, Jesse, about how conspiracies kind of perpetuate themselves. Because he said, look, suddenly this really high-end security researcher who single-handedly thwarted one of the biggest security flaws in history, which was the big DNS cache poisoning vulnerability that he found back in, I think, 2010, he's suddenly gone suddenly this huge block of net of this net space lights up and in july there's supposed to be this cyber war exercise being undertaken by um not the world economic forum but they're writing about it they're saying you know this is this happens every year and this year the theme is a cyber pandemic a cyber infection theme and he sort of connected those three dots together and said isn't this kind of weird and i even thought that is kind of weird now of course um mr kamensky passed away from natural causes a a, a a health condition he'd been struggling with for a couple of years um and then but then we're left with these other two data points it's like wouldn't it be weird because you know the conspiracy theorists trot out the exercises on 9-11, the exercises, the 420 event before the COVID pandemic, and now we have this supposed cyber cyber Armageddon war game being played out this coming July, and months ahead of that happening, this ginormous block of net space that has been slumbering since the dawn of the internet suddenly lights up, 
Skynet and, uh, you know, is locked and loaded. For what? Who knows? Charles, you got to step up after that one. <laughs> well, I, I really like your theme uh, suggestion, Jesse, that this let's let's contextualize this in the broader scheme of cyber warfare um, in all of its levels. And, and uh, you mentioned the geopolitical one, which would be the nation state, right? The nation states uh, sort of competing for um, dominance or perhaps survival or an edge. Um, and and the edge being, uh, broadly speaking, asymmetric warfare, where if you're going to go um, with field armies and um, how many air, aircraft you have and um, your kinetic firepower and your satellite system and all these things of conventional warfare, then you're at a disadvantage against the, the very large militaries. But cyber warfare, as I think the North Koreans have, have successfully proven in terms of stealing billions, apparently, <laughs> of dollars in various uh, cyber warfare techniques, that, that's really cheap compared to a single F-35 fighter at 300 million each, right? And throw in another 100 million each for maintenance and training of the pilot and so on and so forth. So I think um, that's a really good topic. And, um, and so there's going to be a, a land rush here. And they're already, it's already visible. Every player looks at this and goes, I can get leverage if I can get a little in here, right? In terms of cost effectiveness of asymmetric warfare, right? If you, can, if you can get an edge and break into somebody else's network, that is dirt cheap compared to other forms of warfare, right? And much less risky than nuclear uh, a sort of uh, gaming, right? Because if you game wrong or a human error occurs, then you've launched Armageddon, right? So, and, and I don't discount that. A lot of people seem to think that because cyber warfare is now the, the key theater, that nuclear uh, warfare is out the window. It's like, no, absolutely not. Uh, there's lots of technical errors where, you know, there's been many cases where a radar system picked up cloud cover and de declared an incoming missile strike and some human being had to decide to wait or push the button. So um, I, I and then I just want to throw in something else um, that I've been working on called the social ontology. And, and what I mean by this is when we talk about network states and nation states, each nation state has a what I call a social ontology, um, which is sort of an intangible but very real to the inhabitants. And it includes the values, narratives, um, purposes, uh, goals, and incentives embedded in each nation state's social ontology. Well, network states have their own social ontology. So in my perspective on, on cyber warfare is you can, you can hack somebody's network, but you can't hack their social ontology. And so the, the superior social ontology, the one that serves the population more effectively is 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 you can't really crush that in the same way you can you can bring down a network that's that's an interesting idea and i mean it speaks i think both to the hypocrisy or alternatively virtues right of of a state or of a nation or of a network that you know how does it serve its constituents and do its constituents believe it's being served i mean this is where we get into the kind of origins or foundations of political theory, which is the relationship between, the, you know, the subject and the sovereign. Now, in this context, I feel we also have to acknowledge, as Mark evoked, the role of propaganda, right? Or the, 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 the role of lies and deceit, because states have always employed lies and deceit to make the public feel that they are being served by their sovereign, that they are, you know, getting the best of all possible worlds. And all those other countries, they're just crooks. They're corrupt. They're, they're immoral. Right. And, and that's where I, I think we're in a situation in which, you know, cybersecurity is both the fog of war and the war itself. Right. It's meant as a distraction. It's meant as a, a, a big sleight of hand. And yet, to your point, Charles, it is substantive. It could result in conventional warfare or even nuclear warfare. You know, relatedly, uh, uh, Iran suffered a cyber attack, although the details of which are not at all clear. 
because we certainly can't trust the uh, government of Iran and we can't really trust anyone who would oppose the government of Iran either because, you know, there's incentives for all sides to lie. But Iran claimed once again that its nuclear research facilities, its nuclear enrichment facilities were subject to cyber sabotage. Uh, we have good reason to believe that the first time this happened, it was a collaboration between U.S. and Israeli intelligence to create a cyber weapon, right? A kind of Stuxnet, it was called, a kind of worm that would crawl in industrial systems until it found its ideal target and then basically make the machine malfunction on purpose to destroy it. In theory, that has happened again, but we don't have the details. And it speaks to how there are these battles going on. There is this war, this asymmetrical war being waged that, you know, I, I've i often in the past argued that nation states and network states are not mutually exclusive. And the smart nation states are by necessity or by design employing networks as part of their operations. And the government of Iran is an excellent example of that. That by necessity, due to sanctions, due to the type of uh, military conflicts they are in with their neighbors and with the superpowers, they've been engaged in proxy wars via Hezbollah. They've been engaged in proxy wars via all sorts of different organizations. That kind of, in my view, gives Iran the early shapings of a network state because they're transcending their traditional nation to try to be a regional player, to try to be almost a Shia state, right, as a kind of larger regional goal. So I think the way in which we connect cyber conflict to our larger discussion on nation states and network states is it's the blurry boundary in which these different entities all connect. Because here's another question to think of. Who are the armament suppliers in the cyber war? Who's building the weapons and who is weaponizing, right, some of the information? And this gets back to where Mark started in terms of the IP space. Because I, you know, I, I quite enjoyed your description, Mark. Thank you. And, and you know, you uh, illustrated a couple of points that I suspected but didn't understand. One was the DDoS potential. Right. Because what is an IP address other than an identity? And the more identities you possess, well, vote early, vote often, I say. <laughs> and, and that's where IP addresses could play a, a very important role, which is why I like your notion of social ontology, Charles. But I would argue it is still subject to manipulation. Right. Never underestimate the power of propaganda in our contemporary period. And my point about who are the weapons manufacturers in the cyber war, we know in many cases they're private actors. Right. We know in many cases they are networks. So that's why I say in the cyber war, we see nation states and network states competing, fighting, supplying, allying with each other in all sorts of interesting ways that does uh, perhaps further reinforce our hypothesis, our, or rather Harold Innes's hypothesis, that with every new technology comes a new empire. I just want to clarify because I wrote in my notes, Brian Anderson, did I say Brian Anderson? It's Brian Jackson, <laughs> sorry. I, I could have swore you said Brian Jackson. Yeah, okay. I wrote I'm down. I'm pretty sure you got Anderson. it right when you said it, but good to clarify. Yeah, because Anderson was was one of my editors at O'Reilly, but um, and his show, Brian Jackson's show, is Tech Insights Research Group. So that's now we've got everything totally. Although, if if you feel the need to go there, it's Tech Insights is the name of the podcast, and it's put out by the Information Technology Research Group (ITRG). Okay. All right. And, and, and in their it. fault, they're not very clear about that. They could well, do a whole funny. lot better job being, you know, a little more transparent about what they're doing. Sorry, Mark. Go ahead. It's, it's funny because in the podcast, when I said, oh, let's, you know, itbusiness.ca, for example, he thanked me for using, oh, well, thanks for personalizing the URL in your example. He didn't say you got it wrong, but uh, oh, well. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we'll link to the absolute right destination in the show notes. Um, I want to talk about asymmetry because one of the books I'm reading right now, I can't remember which one it is because I've got so many on the go, 
talks about how as World War I was approaching, there were only a few people who had a sense that World War I was going to be very different from the, any war previously, that it was going to be an industrial scale slaughterhouse. And they tried to warn leaders and, and this is not going to be cavalry gallantly riding over the hill with flags. This is going to be down and dirty and, 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 and horrific. And so the next war hit and very few policymakers and leaders were prepared for it. It just kind of took on a logic of its own. The same thing is going to happen in this, you know, what we think is, are we already in a World War III? And very few, there are a few people trying to say, listen, the next war is going to be very different because one of the dimensions in which it's going to be conducted, the theater is going to be cyber, like the internet. And, and very few, it may be raging and people don't even realize that it's on right now. And the, the asymmetry that Charles started talking about, like you've got to put an F-35 on an aircraft carrier, you're talking hundreds of billions of dollars all in there. But if you encrypt something vital, it, it, it takes way more processing power to decrypt it. You can't in, in a lot of cases than it did to encrypt it. And so um, there's a guy who I'm following on Twitter. His name is Robert uh, Richard Breedlove, Robert Breedlove. I'm horrible today. I apologize to everybody who I mangle. Um, he's writing a successor book to The Sovereign Individual, which is a book that I rave about a lot from the mid '90s. And he's doing sort of like a modernized addendum to it. And he, you know, his his point was cryptography completely tipped the scales of power because in the old days it took a lot of energy to build something and less energy to blow it up, right? It took, it took, took 20 years to build a castle or a cathedral and you hit it with a few cannons and it's over in one afternoon. But if you encrypt something with just a passphrase in your brain wallet, in your head, all the computing power in the world can't undo that encryption. And so that, that innocuous enough asymmetry and turning about of the energy requirements completely flipped the um, the strategic imperatives and the logic behind conflict and power. And it's what, what, what is actually impelling this whole change from nation state to network state. And something I actually just put it out today on Bomb Thrower, this idea that I don't think nation states are going to go away. I, I, I sort of talked pretty maybe with a little bit of finality in the article but what i what i was trying to explain is they are conducting themselves with this kind of cavalier imperiousness like whatever happens from here on in is up to us and i don't think they've really gotten the memo that they're just another player in a multipolar world and the multipolar world is not just in the geopolitical dimension it's going to be in the cyber dimension and in the network dimension and they're just another power player in that mix although let me disagree on that last point i don't feel that cyber or network transcends geopolitics insofar as we still have bodies and there are still states that can inflict violence on our bodies absolutely i just mean it's another dimension to it that they're sort of assuming that they will have complete dominance in that dimension. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Be the case. I agree with that general argument. Absolutely. I, I'm just saying I kind of appreciate the phrase, the geopolitics of cyberspace, because it suggests that these are not random teenagers who are hacking each other. These are nation states. These are, mm. you know, uh, entities that have stakes in the real world that are fighting for stakes in the virtual world because their real world is at stake. To your point, they just don't under... Well, actually, we shouldn't say that. I think some people inside these governments do feel the way we do and think the way we do. It's just not really the political class, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the paradox of governments in general, is that there are professional civil servants who can think for themselves and nobody listens to, but nonetheless are paid professionals to think about these things and they legitimately are thinking about these things and writing reports that nobody reads right so it's not as if these governments have no clue it's worse than that 
these governments do have a clue and are getting advice from reasonable people. And it's the nature of our electoral system. It's the nature of who becomes a politician and what happens to that politician and the influences, the literal lobbying that they are subjected to that makes it hard for them to make the right decision. We've certainly seen this when it comes to climate change. I think we're definitely seeing this when it comes to the pandemic. And I think we're totally seeing this when it comes to cyber, whether cyber war or whether thinking about the internet as an economic engine or a cultural engine or all the many things that it does, which goes back to the social ontology point that I feel the internet is creating its own social ontology that a network state, whether Facebook, Amazon, Iran, China, whoever, the, f the network state that harnesses the social ontology that the internet creates and synonymizes themselves with that, that is a tremendous kind of, of synergy, of power to harness, because it represents the kind of zeitgeist, the cultural, economic, political of our era. Because I feel that when I'm in an online community, right? When I'm in an active discord, when, you know, back in the day when I was on a hop and Usenet group, you know, when you're on a, a major domo email list, I earlier today cited Slashdot and their meta moderation system. Like there's all sorts of environments that anyone who's been on the internet long enough has experienced where you just look at it or you imagine yourself looking at everyone else in the virtual room like this is different. We're here. This is the internet, right? And then you go back into the real world. You're like, fuck, what happened? <laughs> right, I, I like that society I was just in, I, and and I think that we are reaching a tipping point where whatever institution, whatever government, whatever state can harness and synonymize that, they are going to have tremendous power because people desire it, people covet it, and and Facebook and all these digital giants, they are pale imitations, but because they are just imitations, they are nonetheless harnessing that kind of power. So Charles, I'm curious you know, to have you elaborate a little on this notion of a social ontology, if I'm getting that right, and how you imagine that both in the positive and the negative, positive perhaps being climb, the negative being of your choosing in this network state that we're conceiving of or that we're trying to imagine. Yeah, well, thank you for that. That's a great question. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work that out myself because, um, I, I think you're absolutely right that the internet itself it creates a, a has created a social ontology. And what's interesting about it, of course, is that it's not centralized, right? Mm -hmm. And that the propaganda uh, generated social ontologies that you you mentioned earlier, where the nation state controls the narrative and constantly persuades the people of of a of the purpose of the nation, the goals, the you know incentives, all that stuff are built into the the nation state um, elements that it controls, right? Like the taxation system or the the political incentives, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think part of uh, what I see is the nation state has what I call an ontological imperative. And I wrote about this in my book like ten years ago, uh, Resistance, Revolution, and Liberation. This nation state sees everything as a potential threat, right? It has to, right? It's a it's a threat based environment, like, and so the way to combat any threat is to take control of every element of that threat. So this is how you get global hegemony. In other words, the United States and its allies look at the entire world as nothing but bristling with threats, and so we need to control literally everything. So. You know, they wired the entire, you know, oceans for sound, right? <laughs> Just to give one example, right? And so the cyber war is the perfection of this ontology of the imperative of control. Like, in other words, the entire Internet's now a threat. So we're going to need to control every aspect of it through centralized control. Now, this is interesting because it, um, you know, it, it calls to mind what we're often talking about, which is, centralizing, trying to control decentralized open source opt-in self-organizing systems doesn't work. They outperform, outcompete centralized systems, right? 
And so the nation state that's going to win in your sense of, of um, harnessing the power of networks is the nation state that's going to do what I think is impossible, which is to let go of power, to decentralize what what every fiber of their being and every person in that government and every historical example is centralize, 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 contra, you know, concentrate all power into one centralized thing so, and then control everything. That's actually the wrong model. So the let, nation state that lets go of that is going to is going to win. So let me ask a follow up question then, because I agree no nation state would do that willingly. No. But what about a nation state that's forced to do that? And and one example, I'm not celebrating this, I'm just pointing to it, is the Tibetan government in exile, right? And they're not alone. Like there are n other nation states that perhaps through conquest, through displacement, maybe through climate catastrophe, if we're going to anticipate what could happen, that they could be forced to decentralize, not by choice, but by necessity, then creating the opportunity for this. Thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. And so it's it's um, one of those things of do you embrace um, transformation or do you fight it and go down, you know, uh, fighting the, uh, a future, a different model. Mm -hmm. So, Mark, do you, I, I feel like we need to give you a chance to step in here. I was just going to say that um, we have to also consider that there isn't going to be a one to one correlation between a nation a nation state and its network state presence i think because network states just don't lend themselves to that configuration so you can have um uh what looks like a unified nation state in that dimension that has multiple uh tendrils or factions or network in the network dimension that may not be in harmony with each other or 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 sometimes they are sometimes they aren't it's almost like a whole different um well dimension to it and i'll, I'll just i'm gonna make an example but i don't want anyone to take it too seriously but Donald Trump just launched his own sort of mini social network, right? Uh, from the desk, you know, donaldjtrump.com slash desk, because all of the social media networks have kicked him off. So he just created his own. Now, imagine if that was a deposed leader of a country in exile, which he kind of almost is. I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's an Mar-a-Lago is exile. I'm with you. 100%. Yes, we're making a metaphor here. So or, Tibet or whatever, you know, so some, and, it, and it's like they've got this reach out here in the network state, uh, you know, and and then they have this sort of like, uh, you know, compromised existence in the physical layer on the nation state. And it's and it it's all going to look very, very different very soon i think and and i i even wonder i mean again so as the I, I really think these monolithic nation states of today really i really do think their days are numbered like canada united states the eu zone all of it it's just like it's not gonna they're not gonna break up there's not gonna be outright secessions it's just gonna be kind of de facto uh, you know what? We use Imperial, you use metric and we kind of like do this out here. And, and it's just going to be this, this mishmash of cyber balkanization that, you know, depending on what layer you're functioning in. Now, I mean, sometimes it can get carried away. Like some of the, some of the real cryptocurrency utopians say, Oh, your physical presence isn't going to matter because you have this like cyber, Cyberland, where you own a palace and a mansion and i kind of listen to those and i think what are you thinking really like what do you eat where do you sleep how do you exist like what are you breathing when you're breathing physically so you can you can get too caught up in the in the mindset of it but i think there you know the majority of the people don't have an appreciation for how abstract reality is getting and there are some people who are too over abstracted and they're literally head, you know, living in the cloud, get your feet back on the earth. But I think it really is transforming what we understand to be a nation state. And sometimes I get caught up in this, 
you know, how much there's more regulation, like Bill C-10 in Canada and all of that's happening. And then I kind of have to take a step back and breathe and go, you know what? It doesn't even really matter. <laughs> like if they pass it, if they don't pass it, if they think it means this, it doesn't matter because they're operating at sort of one level below where the world is going. So, But it does matter. And it matters for a range of reasons. And I think that's the trap you get caught into. Right. Mm. In that if if we evoke the notion of, of a Potemkin village, right, that the nation state is a reverse Potemkin village where a Potemkin village was created by Potemkin for the Tsar to sort of make it look as if there was a village here where it wasn't. And we've got the opposite. There used to be a village, but it's been completely hollowed out. So the shell is still there and behind it is a kind of Wizard of Oz who's making it look like it's this grand thing, but really they don't want you to look behind the curtain. And the trap that you keep falling for, Mark, is you keep calling it a village. You keep saying, oh, the government's doing this and oh, the government's doing that. The government's going, ha ha, right on, man. We got people opposing us. We got people thinking that we're capable and we're competent. Cha-ching, success. Whether our policy does anything, that doesn't matter because we know we don't have the ability to do anything. But if people are opposing us, that means we're real. Oh, my God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Meanwhile, Amazon's declared record profits. Right. Meanwhile, you know, Facebook continues to gobble up more attention. So allow me to offer a metaphor or an analogy, which I thought of when Charles was talking about the social ontology. And I was thinking about it not on a cultural level, but on a methodology level, because if you think about our methods, they reflect our culture. They reflect our technology. They reflect our values, our politics, all of it how we choose to conduct our business, how we choose to lead our lives, that reflects a, a culmination of choices. So agriculture. Right now, there are two revolutions happening in agriculture. A revolution in regenerative agriculture, or what I like to call agroecology, which is all about harnessing nature and working with nature to achieve tremendous results. Because rather than trying to control nature, Rather than taking a centralized approach, you take a decentralized approach and just harness what's going on anyway, but give little nudges and directions and cultivation so it works for you in terms of your, your food, right? That's kind of the stuff that my family's into. But then you got the revolution in precision agriculture, artificial intelligence, technology-driven industrial agriculture. And that's something I study. That's something that interests me. And these are polar opposites, right? Regenerative agriculture says, hey, let's do without pesticides. Let's do without herbicides. Let's harness nature. You know, the AI one, it says, let's use less herbicides. Let's use less pesticides. Let's try to be more responsible. But it's still a doubling down on centralized, industrialized control of nature. Right. It's a reinforcement of the model that the land can be controlled. The animals can be controlled. The environmental conditions can be controlled. So what you see is a bifurcation. The centralized model, it's optimizing constantly, constantly optimizing to become more effective, more powerful, even if it's a charade. Even if it doesn't actually achieve what it used to achieve, right? Like industrial agriculture is itself a kind of facade because only people who've been in it for six generations can do it. And even then, what they're doing to their soil, they know that that soil is going to have limited productivity, right? So even they know that there's a limit to what they can do, and yet they are still going billions of dollars in on that's how we should base our food compared to the regenerative agriculture side where it, it's what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not dispersed, not small, but it goes to Charles's point of, of his uh, conversations around energy, that if we don't rethink our relationship to energy on a whole scale, we're going to have a huge reckoning. And the regenerative agriculture people say, if we don't have a rethink on how we relate to food, we're going to have a big reckoning. So, both of these systems are going on. They're not necessarily in conflict, but this is why I think to your earlier point, Mark, the nation state and the network state are not one-to-one -one comparables. 
They coexist. They do different things. I share with you the snow crash model that the nation state's going to be half privatized, half fall apart, and half still be a myth that's going on. And that's where I do think these policies are important, but maybe why we should ignore them and not talk about them and not give attention to that. Instead, talk about the cool open source farm robots that I've been studying and how they'll allow anyone to be a farmer in their own backyard. Well, you know, it's um, I'm going to introduce a third element here that um, that Jesse uh, referenced in an email to uh, Mark and I a couple of weeks ago about um, the maritime network state. Um, and I guess what I want to bring in here is the commercial aspects of the of the network state um, that are not um, Facebook, Google, et cetera. Right. They're not big tech. They are uh, private mostly private uh, networks that control key elements of, of the infrastructure of, of the global economy, right? And the maritime network is, is an excellent choice because you can have a nation state, but if um, all the container ships are owned by three companies and um, you get into a dispute with them, well, good luck because you're not going to be able to duplicate their container fleet overnight or maybe ever. And there's a lot of these networks. In fact, one I've been thinking about is um, philanthro capitalist foundations. And, and um, I, 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 would have, I would love to take credit for that term, but it, um, I borrowed it from somebody. I can't remember who originated it. Philanthro capitalist foundations are, uh, uh, to Jesse's question about um, perverse or, or perversely uh, synergistic network states, philanthro capitalist foundations are a good example of this because they have financial scale equivalent to major corporations, right? And they work together, you know, they all share staff and it's very much like interlocking directorships, right, of of corporations. Um, And so they control huge amounts of aid and the management of aid and they can have more influence than the nation state that they're supposedly working with, right? So that's another example of, of a system that's quasi state-like um, and, and global in scale. And then, and then um, when we talk about things like climb um, or faith-based networks, that kind of thing, we're talking about community level uh, networks that, that could be quite influential in terms of creating a, a positive, uh, compelling social ontology and they would sit sort of, as to Jesse's point and, and Mark's point, both of you talking about sitting sort of uncomfortably here in this shifting Venn diagram of nation states, big tech, um, other other network states, and real life. <laughs> you know, like like how you grow your food, and and that that uh, just to to I'll end on this point that you know Jesse, when you describe regenerative um, agriculture or agroecology. That's a perfect example in my mind of a, of a social ontology that's sort of um, developed on its own, that it, it, it generates its own system of values, its own purpose, its own goals, its own incentives, and its own narratives. And those are really powerful, and they're actually more influential in the real world than whatever ontologies are created by big tech or, or other, you know, sort of abstract, to use Mark's terms, abstract stuff i mean yes and no i i i agree they have greater potential but it's the scale that big tech can achieve it's the volume the amplification the sheer out loudness right compared to you know individual voices compared to something that's more kind of you know bottom up and it's remarkable how you know in this yeah uh, internet world we're currently living in how many people i connect with you know online and i'll use a, a shot of my chickens And it's it is so foreign to them, right? Like living with animals, living in nature, you know, what has quickly become normal for me feels ancestral, feels, you know, time, uh, timeless. It is remarkable how to many other people is completely alien and completely foreign. And yet Facebook is very normal. Facebook has a, a frame of reference, even though there's lots of people who don't use Facebook and lots of people who Facebook causes them to have a gag reflex. Uh, there are many more who it is very easy for them to use. Mark? 
I mean, there was a guy named Rudolf Steiner who invented a lot of things. He invented the Waldorf School, and he's credited with inventing organic farming or biodynamic farming. This is back in the 1900s. And he, I mean, this is very much what you're talking about, Jesse, that whole um, sort of more holistic approach to to um, being in harmony with what you're farming or cultivating rather than, than mechanizing it. And he also wrote that humanity was heading into this period where we would become far more mechanistic than than we had been prior to that age. And he actually said it would, I mean, he was a bit of a mystic and sometimes you read his stuff, it's impenetrable and really out there and hard to decipher. I, I sort of have this personal pet theory that, that he was in almost a somnambulistic state for most of his waking life. But um, he, he would grab these sort of imagery and he would try to put it in the words. And, and so he's, and, and, but he did, accurately capture this sort of um this mechanizing of everything to the point where we sort of optimize out our own humanity and spirituality and and psychicness and and just it's like a, 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 we're just reduced to this ping pong ball universe of efficiency and algorithms right and 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 then we can just scale it up and the same dynamic, I mean, I always come back to this, I don't mean to, but it's just what I know, the same dynamic comes back to economics, okay? Like Austrian school economics versus, you know, modern monetary theory. This idea that if you let these market signals interact with each other, you're going to figure out what the interest rates are supposed to be it will find its own equilibrium for the current circumstances. When those circumstances change, it's going to find another clearing level. Whereas now you have these people, a committee kind of like writing a number every second Wednesday of the month at 2 PM. And here it is, this is the optimal interest rate. And we're going to just everything keys to that algos upon algos assets upon assets, rehypothecated. It's all very mechanistic. And that's why right now, the entire system, not just the financial system, but the agro system, big agro, big pharma, supply chains, all of it, it's like a big Jenga tower, right? And it's all put together to perfection. And if you knock one little block out from that Jenga tower, the whole thing across all systems is going to like have a serious problem. Whereas these other systems that are considered antiquated and out of date and, and primitive, they just kind of keep ticking, right? Like something goes wrong and they kind of take a setback and they kind of reorganize themselves and just keep plodding along. They're, they're anti-fragile or they find this natural state of equilibrium. And so um, I don't really know exactly what the point I was making there, just other than recognizing that that seems to be this, this, um, this pattern. I don't know, call it uh, holistic versus mechanized optimized yeah let me jump in here and talk about systems a bit because um mark uh had introduced uh, jesse and i to uh, at least uh to elements of Perito's work um vilfredo Perito, that uh you know one of his things was the Perito distribution the 80 20 rule it, it may have been uh, it was news to me. It was it was it was all new. His sociological work. Now maybe Jesse was familiar with it, but he he was very interested in equilibrium, and of course he he looked at it economically. But I think um, to to Jesse's point about agriculture, there's a lot of other equilibriums that we have to maintain, like soil health, right? And if you lose that, or you lose the equilibrium of the of the of the wild fisheries, then you've lost something that you cannot replace with a fish farm, and so the the dynamics of equilibrium um, have been explored by a lot of things: chaos theory, uh, Mandelbrot, fractals. You know, there's a lot of mathematics um, that can be invoked, but the basic idea is evolution seeks a dynamic equilibrium, right? And so uh, the um, evolution has this. Uh, observable state um, where w when everything is uh, 
nominal, right? And and the the sort of um, steady state, you know. In other words, there's a little fluctuation in weather or insect populations or whatever, but the system has a, a has is quite stable within a narrow band. But then something happens, like an ice age, and then evolution has to kick up and and speed up and accelerate to uh, adjust. And so um, this is called punctuated equilibrium <laughs> in evolutionary theory. And so um, the reason why I'm invoking that is to, to Mark's point, equilibrium is, is, is the source of stability. And that's what Talib uh, uh, talks a lot about in terms of anti-fragility. He's really describing a system of dynamic uh, coherence or dynamic um, equilibrium, right? Where the, the the more your system can respond and and um, come up with variability, like mutations and experimentation, descent, all, all these are manifestations of variability, then that's gonna evolve much faster and more successfully than something which is rigid, brittle, uh, centralized, locked down, you know, et cetera. So I think in a, in a broader context of systems analysis, what we're describing is that the world's has entered an era where the costs and benefits of, of um, either encouraging fast evolution or limiting it and restraining it are gonna be huge. Do you wanna elaborate on that a little? Well, so in terms of the, the impact of, of cyber warfare, uh, the cyberspace, um, cryptocurrencies, the network states, all of those are creating, in, in my view, um, dynamics which have, you know, as we all know, good and bad characteristics depending on what you're seeking, what's, who's optimizing what, what the incentives of the system are. But they're creating all these competing social ontologies, right? And so um, which ones will be most successful is unknown, right? It, it's going to be a mix of this and that. And, and so the point I'm, I'm trying to make is uh, it, dynamic equilibrium is like it's like an ecosystem that's or like the, the an organism like the human body right it, it goes up and down your blood sugar is constantly in motion you're, you're you've got uh, levels of salt and all this stuff goes on automatically and it's seeking like a a, a set point right like a, an equilibrium that's um that's within acceptable boundaries and the same with with uh ecosystems right but when they get thrown out of balance then um the survivors have to evolve very quickly and successfully. And so the more mutations you have, which is another way of saying the more experimentation, the more variety you have in your culture or economy, and, um, and the more you encourage experimentation, the more flexible you are in terms of what your goals, purposes, and incentives are, um, then you're more likely to come up with a successful uh, um, evolutionary response to dramatic change. And the more that you cling to something and demand that, that the system stays exactly the same in terms of uh, narratives, purpose, goals, incentives, um, then the more likely it is you're going to die because uh, you're on it, you've killed off most of your experimentation, dissent, and, and mutations, right? And so what I think we're really talking about is the, na the network state and the nation state are both attempting to evolve to meet these new conditions. And... Um, and survive number one and um, become dominant <laughs> if that's if that's the goal um, but it's it's not within their their power you know to control which what system or set of systems wins in the long run the only thing you can control is do you encourage fast evolution or do you restrict it and the system and every nation state or network state that attempts to restrict uh, fast evolution will end up being paired away and the yeah, ones that say it's an open, it's it's an open game, open source, go for it. Th those are the systems that are going to survive and prosper. I, I disagree with the dichotomy as you drew it, in the sense that I don't think that rapid evolution, for the sake of rapid evolution, is the path for survival or success for a nation state or anybody. The same way that I reject the idea that uh, uh, ecosystems or systems seek equilibrium in any way. I think that's generally been debunked. But I do agree that stasis is death. The question is, how do you manage change, right? If an institution that is incapable of rapid change engages in rapid change, it only speeds up its death, right? And that is partly why nation states are in such a pickle, 
because they can't harness the speed of innovation that network states can. And yet at the same time, they can't, they can't embrace, they can't stick with the status quo, right? They can't embrace stasis. They got to do something. And, and that's where I think there is a middle path for them. Whether they choose that path, I am very skeptical of. But I do see a scenario, a very real scenario, in which smaller nations like Estonia, for example, will thrive uh, quite well in such a hybrid environment. Uh, for different motivational needs, right? Estonia's got Russia looming uh, right at their border, and they're a relatively small country, so it's pretty easy for them to commit to the kind of digital infrastructure that they have. So I think that gives them a potential when it comes to a resilience, but I'm not so convinced that it's as clear-cut in terms of there will be change, but the question is, what is that change? That's why I use words like responsiveness and capability and capacity and literacy in terms of the one's ability to respond to that stuff. But what I take as the moral of climate volatility is not that we can predict climate change. It's not even that the climate is going to return to some kind of equilibrium. It's all bets are off. And you can guarantee that something's going to happen. We don't know. We don't know why, but it's going to be wild. And that's why I got the F out of the city. Because I was like, that's oh, not the place I want to be when a climate catastrophe comes. So I changed my entire life because I believed that that catastrophe was coming. It turned out it was a pandemic. Boy, did that bet pay off there. But nonetheless, I think that there is a system uh, crisis that uh, permeates all of this. And that's part of what we continually try to wrap our heads around. And that's where I'm, I, I, again, I push back on the equilibrium because I don't think, I don't think that crisis is gonna end in our lifetimes, right? I think the nature of that crisis is that crisis is gonna become the new normal. Because I think the flip side to this is uh, we are steadily becoming less ignorant. Like ignorant we remain, but one of the consequences of digital technology, one of the consequences of uh, the U.S. government's desire to surveil and control, because that's been one of the industries, to your point, Charles, that has enabled the total surveillance of the ocean, that has enabled the total surveillance of the skies, that has enabled, you know, growing uh, surveillance of the environment as we know it. So I would argue that climate change would have happened anyway. We just would have said it was the gods. But now we have the ability to go, oh, wait a minute. Maybe it's not the gods. Maybe it's us burning them fossil fuels. Either way, these things are still going to happen. And I think part of what we're seeing is the human ability to understand our environment more effectively, which means that rather than come up with a narrative of equilibrium, we're going to come up with a narrative of chaos because that is exactly what we're going to find, except the consequence of that beneficially is that we'll be able to respond to chaos. We'll be cool with chaos. We'll be comfortable with it. We'll be like, all right, it's just a big storm batting down the hatches, right? And that, I think, is is the positive outcome or a silver lining when it, it comes to this mess. Mark, final thoughts? Yeah, I was just, I don't really have a lot to add to that other than our policymakers' obsession seems to be with eliminating all negative consequences, which perpetuates even worse consequences. And so if we could embrace that anti-fragility, build systems with shock absorbers, don't build systems and models to perfection, build them to withstand, you know, build them with margins for error. That's what you need to do. So it's like, I, I don't think anybody in the world can predict what the climate's going to do, how much man is causing, how much the sun is causing, and what the outcome is going to be either way. It could be something completely different than what we expected. All we really know is something's going to happen and we don't know what. So we have to buy the equivalent of an option straddle for positioning for whether everything gets hotter, or everything gets colder, or everything just like does something completely unexpected. That's all we know. And then it's at man has this ability to adapt that we should embrace instead of trying to like build these models that say, Nothing bad is ever going to happen again. We're not going to have another recession. We're not going to have this or this or this or this. And that causes even more problems. Charles, human any last words? Human hubris. 
Yeah. I love that Blue Oyster Cult song, Godzilla, right? Nature points out again and again. No, history shows again and again how nature points out the folly of man. Godzilla. You got to put that song in the tail credits of the thing when you edit this. <laughs> All right. With that said, let's fade to black. All right. Oh, wait, except you probably want to give some kind of ending or closing. Go ahead. Sure. Accessofeasy.com. That was episode 43. Like us on Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, iTunes. Leave us a review. Help other people find us. I don't know where to find us sometimes, but accessofeasy.com is a good place to start. See you in a couple of weeks. Bye.